Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. You know, we are standing by the perfect field to talk about fixing low pH soil. Yes, across almost every field that we talk about, there's going to be a little variance in pH. Do you know what that is and where you're low? Do you know how to fix it? We'll talk about that today. Well, I actually thought you were going to say we're standing next to the perfect field to talk about fall tiling. Improving drainage is so absolutely critical. We want to discuss fall tiling on today's show. Well, another thing that we'll discuss is our weed of the week and how to get it under control. But first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the Enzone Fan Control System from Farm Shop MFG. The Enzone monitors outside conditions to run your fans so your grain naturally reaches ideal temperature and humidity. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about nitrogen stabilizers and what this really comes back to, and especially if you're a non-farmer, I want you to think about nitrate in the water. There are a lot of people that get worried about farmers over applying nitrogen. Well, what many farmers use is nitrogen stabilizers to keep the nitrogen in the field rather than in the water. So we wanted to explain exactly how these things work today. I think, Brian, one of the things too here is when we travel abroad, we see different things. Like for example, when we were in Israel, we saw right on bottled water, it showed how many parts per million of nitrate were in the water. And that made me nervous because I had never seen that before. Wait, wait a minute, they don't do this in the United States. Well, plus when you, don't, got... when you don't read Hebrew, it's a little tough. <laughs> well, that was too, <laughs> but we figured out pretty quickly it was 8.3 parts per million. Well, 8 parts per million of nitrate in the water, is that a level we need to worry about? Absolutely not. And the fact is, when we did a little more digging, there's nitrate in all water. It's just a matter of how much is there going to be. So 10 parts per million of nitrate nitrogen is the drinking water standard in the United States. So if it's 10 parts per million or less, it's deemed as safe. That's the first thing we want you to understand. The second thing is with soil in general, there is what we would call heavy soil that can hold more of all nutrients. There's what we call light soil. So sand, for example, would be light soil and it's easy to leach things out like nitrate. So what farmers try to do is keep nitrogen in the ammonium form rather than the nitrate form. And one of the ways they do that is by using nitrogen stabilizers. Nitrogen stabilizers will prevent that ammonium from converting over to nitrate. So the big thing that we always tell non-farmers is look, Farmers aren't trying to waste money. They're trying everything they possibly can to save money. So they want to keep as much nitrogen in the field as possible. And one of the ways they do that is by using nitrogen stabilizers. And again, what these things do is help prevent nitrogen moving from the ammonium form, which locks into soil and is not leachable, to the nitrate form, which would be leachable. So this is a very important thing that is used on many farms across the United States and really across the world. Well, another important thing that farmers are doing is controlling our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's wheat? Pentair Hypro Ultra Low Drift Nozzles are your ideal choice for the Enlist E3 herbicide system. With coverage comparable to flat fans and with 90% less drift, ULD nozzles meet all required standards for Enlist applications and provide optimal performance of contact herbicides. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. When you apply phosphate fertilizer, it binds to calcium in the soil, becoming calcium phosphate, essentially tooth enamel. How much of this tooth do you think will become available to your crop? NutriCharge doubles your phosphate availability by protecting it from calcium fixation. How much does your crop residue cost you? Over time, residue accumulates in your fields, building excess carbon levels and tying up your plant available nitrogen. Residue also traps P, K, and micros and can take years to naturally become available to your crops. This is because soil lacks the diverse microbial life needed to break it all down. With Decomp, you can naturally restore life to your soil and allow the release of valuable crop fertility. Learn more about Decomp at eggbio.solutions. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy all the way down to the last drop. Agroliquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. 
Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. Engineered to be the most advanced concave system available, the XBR system threshes all crops, reduces grain loss, and significantly improves grain quality and storability. Probably the biggest difference that we noticed right away was the grain quality. The sample was much better with this XBR system. Now we've cut down rotor loss significantly. I can switch out a two pound cover plate in just a few minutes and jumped about 30% more on our capacity. Visit EstesPerformanceConcaves.com. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want. In your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data your way. Case IH, rethink productivity. How do you fix low soil pH? Well, we want to talk about that today. Now, it, the fix really, quite frankly, is pretty simple. But we also want to talk about how did the pH get low in the first place and how small should your grids and zones be? So we want to discuss all of that today. I bought a 60 acre field a number of years ago and I knew that some of the field was going to need some lime. So we did some grid sampling at various grid sizes. Hey, at 10 acre grids, that's not a whole lot of soil sampling work to do. You can pull those in 15 or 20 minutes. Five acre grids took a little more time and smaller grids took more time than that. But what we learned as we went from big grids to smaller grids, we could really narrow down where those low pH spots were at and then only invest in lime where we really needed it. If you make large grids or, or even if you're just taking one sample for the whole field, you just don't get a picture of where you really need the lime. And if you're putting lime out on areas that don't need it, you're definitely not gonna see a return on investment. Well, worse yet, you're gonna have a problem. So I'll just give you the example off our own farm. We were running bigger zones, we were running a lot of five acre grids, and we were liming according to those things. And what we found when we started doing one acre grids is we had made massive mistakes. Now, part of the reason we went to one acre grids is we started noticing on the yield monitor up and down fluctuation in yield in some of these fields where we had limed. Well, what had happened is we had not properly identified where to stop liming. We had five acre grids, but within that five acre grid, there were only an acre or two that actually needed the lime. Some of the rest of the field needed no lime. And now what we had done is taken pH that was actually good in the mid sixes and pushed it up into the sevens by liming where we didn't need the lime. So how do we fix that? Well, first of all, we'd overspent on the lime. We didn't need it. Number two, we'd hurt yields. That cost us money. Number three, to fix it, we have to put elemental sulfur out there. So that's just dumb, dumb, and dumb. And this is what we talk about all the time. Look, if in your fields you've got variants there where you have high pHs and low pHs, please, at least one time, do very small grids, like one acre grids, and find out where you actually need the lime. Spend the money where you truly need it and avoid where you don't, because otherwise you'll end up in the same boat as us where we overspent and then we hurt yield. And you definitely want a variable rate to apply the lime rather than using a flat rate. Now, if your flat rate's really low, okay, you could probably do that. But in most cases, if you're putting lime out there, you want to try and get it done in one shot if you can. So make sure you're doing some variable rates as well. If you've only got to move the pH a little bit, it makes no sense to put on the same rate as when you have to move the pH a long ways. Now we've said several times lime, and I just want to explain when you have low soil pH, basically what you have is just too much hydrogen. How do you fix that hydrogen? You put out calcium carbonate. When you put calcium carbonate or lime onto that soil, you're going to combine the calcium carbonate with the low pH or excess hydrogen that you've got out there. And the result is going to be you're going to end up with water. You're going to end up with carbon dioxide that, don't forget, carbon dioxide is what plants breathe in, so that's great, and free calcium for that soil. So no harm, it's all good, and we just wanted to explain real quick, that's what lime does in a field. Here's a couple of reasons why getting your pH in order is really important. When your pH is way too low, that means it's way too acid, and you also don't have a pH way too high, 
but if you get that pH right in the middle, just slightly acidic in that 6.3 to 6.8 range, what we end up with is nutrient availability being maximized. And you can look at many of the charts that have been out for generations showing exactly at what pH levels nutrients become more available. And by bringing a low pH, say it's down in the fours or low fives, up into the sixes, you just get a free release of a bunch of nutrients that are tied up out in your soil. The other thing that you get is more microbial activity. So beneficial microbes, some like lower pHs, some like higher pHs, but again, if you're somewhere in the middle, you get a majority of those beneficial microbes working for your crop 24 seven for free. So why not get that pH in line where you have more microbial activity and better nutrient availability too. In order to know how much lime you need, you're gonna need to run a buffer pH test. So it's pretty simple. Once you have that, there are formulas out there that will tell you how much lime to put on based on the type of lime that you're using. The other thing that I wanted to stress is that not all crops want a 6.3 to 6.8 pH. Blueberries, for example, you might want to be down in the 5 or 5.5 pH. Alfalfa, barley, there are a few crops that really like close to a 7 pH to maximize the overall production. So just look at the crop you're raising, but the reason why Darren and I talk so much about that 6.3 to 6.8 range is that's the ideal pH for corn, soybeans, and wheat. Well, getting that pH right also allows your crop to compete well against weeds like our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed later in the show. Downtime during spraying can lead to huge yield losses. Keep rolling with the Pentair Hypro Force Field. This pump features a unique self-regulated chamber that allows the pump to run dry while eliminating cracked seals, so you can spray longer and more reliably. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. Norwood Sales wanted a female farm owner to supply a different perspective on yield track planters, so here goes. It has a simple elegance with very practical styling using weather shields to protect electronics and to organize equipment, giving a fit and finish that is unmatched in the industry. But what really excites me is yield tracks productivity, like widening my planting window by 20%, ease and speed of folding, being able to do end of row turns in just six seconds, operating one to two miles per hour faster with no impact on seed spacing or uniform depth, and being able to road transport at 20 miles per hour. Of course, being a bargain shopper, I love it. These tracks pay for themselves in incremental yield on just 1,600 acres at $3 corn. Okay, and yes, I do think that the yield track is cute. Now get over it and call Norwood Sales to learn more. How much money are you leaving in the bin? If you want the most profit from your stored grain, you need the Grain Temp Guard from Farm Shop MFG. This low-cost bin monitoring solution tracks temperature and humidity and gets your grain in ideal condition. And with deep preseason discounts on all Grain Temp Guard units, now is the best time to upgrade. Don't leave your money out in the bin. Get the most from your grain. Order today at farmshopmfg.com. Just a few minutes ago, Darren was making a comment about how if you have soil pH in that kind of mid sixes range, that's about ideal for microbial life. Well, today we're gonna to talk a little about fall tiling and I want you to think, rather than drainage here for a second, think about air in the soil. If you don't have air in the soil and abundant air in the soil, you will also not have good microbial life. 
If you want a healthy soil, I can promise you, you will not have that if you have poor drainage. You have to have good drainage because that allows air to be in the soil, which is great for roots, it's great for microbes, it's great for crops, and it's great for your pocketbook. In addition to not filling every pore in the soil with water and having oxygen in there for soil health, I look at compaction too. Over the last couple of years, much of the country has seen either way too dry at times, but way too wet at many times as well. And we saw so much compaction the last couple of years. Once you do that, you really restrict root growth and you restrict what those soil microbes can do as well. They're just not going to get the air movement down deeper into the soil like they would if you had good soil tilth. So if you went to college or a technical school or you know what, even in high school, if you had a soils class, the first thing they probably taught you was ideal soil compositions, 50% dirt, 25% water, and 25% air. By putting drain tile in the ground, all we're doing is lowering the water table so your soil can still have the 25% air that it needs. So today, what we wanted to focus on here is the number one question we typically get from farmers who are tiling in the fall, and they say, how close together should my tile lines be? I mentioned over the last couple of years there have been some pretty wet areas out there and maybe on your farm you saw the same thing. Maybe even had a pattern tiled field. I had a number of farmers in Minnesota with pattern tile who sent me pictures and said what's going on in my field and you could see exactly where those tile lines were on a hundred foot spacings and it was dark green. And in between those dark green lines every hundred feet through the field there was yellow crop because there was water sitting the lines weren't close enough together. Where some of those same farmers had split lines down to 50 foot tile spacing, they were still noticing some yellow spots in between, but it was less spots out in the field. And so for those farmers, they said, you know, every spot where there's those yellow areas of the field, I'm gonna add a little more tile out there. Now it's one thing when you've got existing tile in the field to be able to add some more lines to it. If you're starting from scratch though, it may be difficult if nobody in your area has done tiling to know exactly where to start. All right, there are a few basic concepts that we'll give you. First of all, the deeper the tile lines, the farther apart technically you could have those tile lines. So back in the old days, people would dig the lines really deep. On our farm even, we have found a few lines that are six or seven feet down in the ground. And you go, what in the world's going on here? Why are they six or seven feet down in the ground? Well, think about when they got put in. Back in the depression era, or even before that, we didn't have a lot of money, but we had lots of labor. So people would go out, they would hand dig going down six or seven feet in the ground and lay these tile lines down. But they didn't have money for the tile, so they thought, you know what, let's put them extra deep. That will give us more drainage going further out. The downside is now we have lowered the water table more. Well, we farm in dryland South Dakota. There are many years we only get 15 or 20 inches of total annual precipitation, and that includes the snow. So the point is, I don't want to lower my water table to six feet, or in most cases, even to four feet. I would like my water table at two and a half to three feet, something like that. So if I have my tile line set at three feet, well, in between, the water table is probably at two and a half feet, something like that. But the point is, if I'm going to set my tile lines shallow, then I need them a little closer together to achieve the same amount of drainage. Now, many drainage contractors in your area or other farmers who have already been putting in some tile can give you a good idea of what they've had good luck with out there for spacing. But I would just say this, whatever spacing you start with, let's say that it's 60 foot spacing in your area, make sure you set that plan up or you could always add more tile in. If you have tile lines just running willy nilly all through the field, it's really hard to add a line in between. But now with GPS, where we're mapping out exactly where those lines are, if we're running fairly straight lines or a consistent pattern, it's a lot easier to add more tile in later if we learn that we need it. Well, it is if your main lines are big enough. So you have a couple different ways to go here. First of all, you could say, all right, what's my dream scenario? How much could I possibly take out of this field? How close together could I possibly want these tile lines? We'll set the mains up for that. Or you could say, you know what, I'm going to divide this up into 
multiple main lines. We call them sub-mains typically. So let's say I had a 160 acre field. Instead of just having one big main line for the whole 160 acres, maybe I have four sub-mains that are out there. So then I've got things just at least a little bit different and maybe in the future, if I haven't properly sized things, I only have a little bit to replace rather than everything to replace. Plus I could have those four sub-mains tie into one really huge main at the end and maybe it does save me some net total dollars because my huge main doesn't have to be quite so long. So there are a lot of different ways to design this thing. The main thing to keep in mind is just keep the water running downhill and you're going to be fine. But like Darren said, you can always add on later if you've got this GPS mapped. And just to talk about that real quick, so in the last 15 years now, we have seen this mapping thing and GPS and all that technology just explode. Farmers used to have to put tile in or tile contractors used to have to put it in using lasers and that was really challenging. Well today we're using sub inch accurate GPS. So in other words, GPS that's literally right out in the field with base stations. So we're connecting with the satellites and with the base stations, sub inch accuracy, it's awesome. And then because of that too, we're able to map everything with GPS. So it's tremendously helpful when you do want to go add things later. And one other thing you may want to take care of while you're out in those fields is our weed of the week. We'll show you how to stop it coming up next. The weed of the week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, agriculture division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher with unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Weed of the week is bull thistle. In the fall, there are so many jobs on the farm, but I'm gonna tell you right now, one of the most important ones may be stopping biennial weeds yep. like bull thistle because they've got a two year growth cycle. If you catch them in that first year where they're in a rosette, you don't ever have to deal with that seed head out in your field or your pasture. But part of the reason we're talking about this today is you're going to have better control if you spray before the first hard frost of the fall. If you wait and spray after the frost, yes, you'll still get some control, but it's not going to be as good. You're going to see more plants out there next spring. Well, when it comes to thistle control, my favorite product is Milestone, but the mistake we see many farmers and ranchers making is spraying too low a rate. Yes, Milestone is not the cheapest product out there, but if you don't use the right rate, you're not gonna do the job you want, killing that root system permanently so you never have to deal with this weed again. Right, so we really like straight Milestone for thistles. You can mix it with something else or you can buy pre-mixed products like let's say Duracore or Grazon Next, that's fine. But again, we really encourage you, bump that rate. When you get to those thistle patches, maybe you have a rate two instead of a rate one. And so yeah, for the annual weeds, I don't really care. Do whatever you want to do there. But the biennials and the perennials, you've got to have a stronger rate. So milestone for pasture and rangeland. In crops, I like status post-emergent corn. In soybeans, I like either enlist soybeans or soybeans that you could spray a dicamba product over. Those would be Maybe. my best post-emerge <laughs> choices. Uh, in wheat, Boy, you've got to do a good job with a Roundup burn down. That would be your best option for control. And again, with any of those crops, a Roundup burn down would be a nice option in, in a crop field. Yeah, but keep in mind, Stinger will absolutely do a great job on most thistles. It's not maybe the best on a bull thistle, but still. Wide Match does contain Stinger, so that's an excellent choice in wheat. That's all the time we have for this week's weed, but Iron Talk is coming up next. Where we have run the Soil Warrior, we have harvested the best corn we have ever harvested in the history of Renwood Farms. 
Now, I'm kind of always wanting to push the envelope to see what else I can do to help enhance that emergence. A ride is so much smoother. Our seed placement is even better. Where we had our best emergence and we've had our best yields was where we ran the soil warrior. Each year brings new and unique challenges to farming, and your operation needs to constantly adapt to meet them. That's why at AgBiome, we're working every day to bring you new and better solutions, microbial-based solutions that protect your crop and help it reach its full potential. To learn more about how we're doing it, visit agbiome.com. AgBiome, feeding the world responsibly, partnering with microbes for human benefit. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the end zone fan control system from Farm Shop MFG. Hot spots and moisture in your bin can cost you thousands in lost revenue. The end zone monitors outside conditions to run your fans exactly when you want them to, naturally bringing your grain to ideal temperature and humidity. Master bin management with the end zone. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy, all the way down to the last drop. Agroliquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want, in your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data your way. Case IH. Rethink productivity. As harvest and fall tillage get rolling, one of the problems that you may be trying to fix on your farm is compaction created last spring by the planter. I'll address this issue in today's Iron Talk. When it's time to plant and soils are wet, you can only realistically wait so long. I'm not encouraging anyone to mud the crop in, but at some point, you probably will end up planting even if conditions aren't perfect. With the size of planters growing dramatically and with central fill units becoming much more prevalent, the four tires taking the brunt of that weight are driven into your soil, creating ruts that severely limit the yield of the rows on either side of them. We've used a two-row combine harvesting our small replicated research plots, and the results we've seen are similar to the data coming out from universities and other seed companies. Yield loss on those rows on either side of deep compaction can easily be 10 to 25% or more. On 200 bushel corn, that could be 50 bushels lost. Two solutions are, number one, to switch back to individual boxes for each row. This would spread out the weight load evenly across the planter. Or number two, is to use tracks on the planter rather than wheels to spread out the load. This spring on our farm, we used the row track carrier system on our early riser planter. We loved the maneuverability of the machine getting into our fields. The tracks eliminated the pinch rows from dual wheels and provided better flotation as we headed across our variable soils. Of course, using both solutions would be the best of all, but since most people don't want to give up their central fill units, well, you can see the dilemma there. Think about this going into the winter, especially if you're trying to fix compaction from your planter right now with fall tillage. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. 
That's all the time we have for today's show, but before we go, we want to invite you to check out the Ag PhD radio show, where we take your live phone calls each weekday at 2 p.m. Central on Sirius XM channel 147. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.